Well, when we think about this issue of leadership, it's all too easy for us to turn to secular resources about leadership, to, uh, uh, as it were, borrow models of leadership from the world and bring them into the church or Christian organizations. But uh, the Bible is in fact filled with examples of leadership. As that passage reminds us, Christian leadership is to be utterly different to the leadership that we find in the world. The leadership that we find in the world is a ruling over other people and often an abusing and oppressing other people. Whereas Jesus set for us a pattern of a different kind of leadership that was uh, serving uh, other people. So we need to be careful uh, to leap to take on board secular models of leadership. That doesn't mean that there aren't things we can learn from uh, the world. Uh, common grace and wisdom mean that uh, uh, sort of non-Christian leaders can often teach us much. But we need to start with the Bible when we think about Christian uh, leadership. And in many ways, the Bible is a book filled with teaching about leadership. The theme of leadership runs all the way through uh, the Bible. The uh, Bible describes certain key categories of leaders um, amongst God's people. The uh, prophets, the priests, the kings of the uh, Old Testament. Leadership roles that were being exercised. In the New Testament, we find the leaders of the, uh, the New Testament church, the apostles, the evangelists, uh, particularly the uh, pastors, the uh, word is shepherd, uh, originally, um, uh, the overseers, uh, the elders, those who are in authority and leadership over local congregations. We find leadership in the context of the family. Husbands are to be leaders of their wives and children. Fathers um, are leaders in uh, their families. We find leadership modelled uh, actually in a variety of different jobs in the Bible. Dominant in the Old Testament, imagery of shepherds leading uh, their flocks, soldiers um, uh, fighting in the army, stewards managing property on behalf of their masters, farmers uh, running and organizing their business. So the Bible is filled with examples of leadership and teaching about leadership. Sometimes those examples are positive, sometimes those examples are negative, and we're to learn from the ways that people led badly. But the Bible is a great resource about leadership, and that shouldn't surprise us. Because the New Testament tells us that Scripture is God-breathed and is um, adequate to equip us for every good work that God might have for us. So our first resource for leadership ought to be the Bible. And of course, supremely, the teaching and the example of the Lord Jesus, who is the one and only perfect leader there has ever been. So secular leadership can teach us something, but we need the Bible to teach us um, how we should lead. So as we begin to dig down into the Bible, what are the foundations for specifically Christian uh, leadership? What is essential if you are to be um, a Christian uh, leader? Uh, and I think these aspects are the ones that those in leadership very easily and quickly forget. When you find yourself in leadership, you can suddenly spend all of your time thinking about management skills, people skills, uh, fundraising, uh, and lose sight of the foundational spiritual qualities on which leadership must be based. And I think many leaders uh, fall into difficulties and fall into sin because they forget these foundations. It's almost as though they've moved on from basics of the Christian life um, and they've lost sight of the foundations. So let me suggest a number of things that are absolutely crucial for Christian leadership. Firstly, Christian leaders must have devotional vitality. What I mean by that is, is in order to be a Christian leader, you must first of all be somebody who is led by Christ. A Christian leader is somebody who is led by Christ. Christ. And I think this is a big mistake many Christian leaders think, mis make. They, they sort of reach a point at which they think they are now leaders, they no longer need to be led. 
But actually, we need to be led by Christ. Christ is Lord. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the one who is ultimately in charge of your local church. He's the one who is ultimately in charge of your Christian organization. He is the one to whom you are ultimately answerable. We need to be led by Christ if we are to be Christian uh, leaders. So uh, to pick up um, a few verses from the New Testament, John chapter 10 reminds us that Jesus is the good shepherd. He is to be our shepherd. We're to hear his voice and obey him. John chapter 15, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. We can only bear fruit if we remain in him and are connected to him and are, in a sense, fed by him. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 and 17 reminds us that Jesus is the one who is supreme in everything. He created everything. He is heir of everything. He is the one in whom fullness is found and we find our fullness in him. So if we don't have a devotional vitality, if we're not sheep following our shepherd, if we're not branches in the vine, if we're not finding our fullness in Christ, we will be ineffective as Christian leaders. So we need to be those who have a deep love for Christ, a deep love for his word, for the Bible, where he speaks and makes himself known to us. We ought to have a deep love for his people. And our ultimate goal ought to be seeking his glory. One of the fundamental problems in leadership is when we fall into seeking our own glory or the glory of our organization or our church, rather than that of Christ. And that's because we've lost our devotional focus. So whatever else you hear this afternoon, if you're a Christian leader, I want to say to you, the most important thing is your devotional life with Christ. There are so many Christian leaders not having a daily quiet time of reading the Bible and praying not going regularly to church and hearing God's word taught. You will not be an effective Christian leader or a leader who lasts if your leadership doesn't flow out of your relationship with Christ. So uh, a, a, a devotional vitality. Secondly, And obviously flowing from that, um, our leadership needs to have uh, and be founded on Christ-like character. We can have all the management skills in the world, the tools of communication, the ability to fundraise, but all of it means nothing and will be dangerous if we're not first and foremost those who develop a Christ-like character. Our leadership needs to flow out of our character. As uh, Francis Schaeffer very famously said, it's not enough just to do the Lord's work, we need to do the Lord's work in the Lord's way. And I think a great danger for many Christian leaders is they think the work is so important that they're prepared to compromise character to get it done. They're prepared to treat people badly and not to exercise Christ-like service and love because they think their job and their ministry is so important. But Christ-like character is the foundation of our leadership. Uh, Again, the uh, very work of the Spirit in us, Galatians chapter 5, is to produce uh, fruit, character qualities of patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. I don't know if you've noticed, but those are largely (coughs) relational qualities about the way we treat other people. Why is it so many Christian leaders get a reputation for treating their staff badly? Well, it's because they've not developed the fruits of the Spirit. We need Christ-like character. When we look in the Bible at the character qualities that are required for church leaders, for a pastor, teacher, elders, in uh, 1 Timothy or in uh, Titus, the emphasis is on character qualities. Uh, the same is true with the selection of the, um, uh, the uh, uh, earliest, as it were, deacons in uh, Acts chapter 6. They were to be men filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. 
all through the Bible there's this sort of theme that says that character is absolutely crucial to uh, leadership. Think, for example, of a great leader like Moses. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3 highlights uh, Moses' humility. You might, on first reading of the book of Exodus and then some of the Pentateuch, not recognize that as being the most important quality about Moses, but Numbers 12, 3, that was held up as being the absolute crucial quality for his uh, leadership. Now, that doesn't mean that he was a pushover or a doormat, but it does mean he submitted himself under the rule of God and he didn't think too much of himself. And of course, closely allied with this development of Christian character is dependence on God in prayer. We see that, of course, in the Lord Jesus himself, who uh, in his ministry and throughout his life was dependent on God in prayer. So uh, when he uh, preached, he uh, prayed. Uh, He made prayer central. He was praying in the, the wilderness when he was tempted. He was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. He prayed before he chose his apostles. Jesus' work and leadership was from a foundation of prayer, which reflects a dependence on God. Actually, that's an issue of character. It's an issue of character recognizing that we can't do it, and we're not capable, and so therefore we need the help of God. So Christian character is essential for ministry. And then thirdly, sacrificial service of others. Sacrificial service of uh, others. This is at the very heart of what Christian leadership means. Christian leadership is all about giving yourself in the service of others. It's not about self-promotion. It's not about um, enjoying power over other people. Those are the great temptations for leaders. One of the things that is... um, (laughs) in a way enjoyable in the world about leadership is the ability to exercise power over others. That's why some people want to become leaders. They want to be able to be in charge and enjoy the status and the power. Well, the Bible tells us that's not what Christian leadership is about. Christian leadership is about self-giving service. And supremely, that is modeled by the example of the Lord Jesus. So uh, John chapter 13, when uh, Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room, he takes the towel and he washes their feet. He does the job that the lowest servant would do, that nobody else had been prepared to do. And he says, I'm setting you an example that you should copy. Uh, Mark uh, chapter uh, 10 uh, speaks of how he's the one who's come to give his life as a ransom for many. And of course, supremely in Philippians chapter 2, Paul says the paradigm example is is the way that Jesus was obedient to death on a cross. He had equal glory with God, but he laid that aside in order to go to the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And that's to be the model of our leadership, a giving of self in service of others. So Christian leadership needs to be founded on a a Christ-like service. It's about serving him and serving uh, others. So I think those are absolutely foundational for Christian leadership. If we don't have devotional vitality, if we don't have Christian character, and if we don't have a servant heart to our leadership, we really won't be Christian leaders at all. We'll be secular leaders working in a Christian context. And in that sense, we will be incredibly dangerous. I think that means that Christian leaders need to work first and foremost on their spiritual life. That is the absolute basis for effective Christian leadership. I personally, when I was first converted as a a student, Uh, From day one of being a Christian, it was kind of drummed into me, read your Bible and pray every day and go to church. And that has been the absolute foundation of my ministry for 
better part of 25 years. Uh, and things like that you just have to prioritize in the sheer busyness of all the demands that come on you as a leader. One of the challenges in leadership is there's always more that you could do. And you feel that you're under pressure from what people want from you, maybe from what your congregation wants from you, maybe from what your board wants from you, from what your other employees want from you. And it's easy to sacrifice that time for personal devotion and uh, church. But to me, those are absolutely crucial uh, to sort of effective Christian leadership. One uh, might add to that, and I haven't put that on the sheet, but it's equally important. If you're married and you have a family, prioritizing your family and your commitment to them ahead of your ministry uh, and job is equally important. It ought to be God first, family second, ministry third. And yet so often leaders get that the wrong way round. So family, where we have family responsibilities, uh, is equally important. Actually, God doesn't call us to set up a tension between family and ministry. If he's given us a family, then actually he wants us to fulfill our responsibilities to our family. And again, that requires discipline um, uh, and making time. Thirdly, what are the competencies for Christian leadership? We've talked about those, as it were, spiritual qualities. We also, if we're to be effective Christian need leaders, need certain competencies for the task that we have. And uh, here, uh, different roles of Christian leadership, different um, uh, ministries that we might have, actually require different competencies. So the skills, the competencies, the gifts, depend upon what the ministry is. If you're running, for example, a Christian television network, then you're going to require different skills than if you're running um, a, a local church, or if you're running a youth ministry, or if you're running an outreach work to people who have been trafficked. That the particular competencies you might need depend on the ministry that you have. But what is crucial for leaders is that they have the right competencies for the ministry they're undertaking. So for whatever the role is that they have, they have to have the right competencies for that role. And real problems arise when people are in leadership, but they don't have the competencies for the job that they've been asked to do. Now, sometimes leaders don't have all the competencies, and they can overcome that by employing other staff or others to work with them. But basically, you need to have the competencies for the role um, that you're doing. Now, this is partly a matter of spiritual gifts. God gives gifts to people to do the work of ministry. And there's a wide range of different gifts that are given. So leaders need to have the appropriate gifts for the role that they're going to undertake. So, uh, for example, in Exodus 31, uh, God commands his people to build the tabernacle but he gifts workers like um, Bezalel to be able to do the work of uh, building the tabernacle and uh, producing um, all of the uh, furniture and the, uh, the curtains. He gives them skills in metalwork, in tapestry, to be able to do the job that needs to be done. They're gifted for that role. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, again, speaking about church leaders, uh, alongside all of the character qualities, Paul says that a, a, an elder must be able to teach, he must be gifted to teach, he must be capable of explaining and applying the doctrines of the faith, because that's crucial to the role. So um, you wouldn't want me to be building the tabernacle because I can't do anything. I can't put up a shelf, let alone kind of design something sophisticated. It's not my gift. But equally, um, you wouldn't want somebody who's got loads of practical gifts but no doctrinal gift to be an elder of a local church. You need to have the right competencies uh, for the role. And one of the key tasks of the church is to discern what people's gifts are. 
And one of the key um, aspects of Christian leadership is to discern your own gifts and the gifts of others. Sometimes people put themselves forward for leadership and they take on leadership when they just haven't got the gifts to do it. Uh, it's possible that you're here today struggling in leadership and the real problem is you haven't got the gifts for the ministry you're trying to do. You actually ought to be in a different ministry. In a way, our leadership will not be effective if we haven't got the gifts that are essential for the ministry that we're undertaking. So um, gifting for the role. Um, also, there's a need to have, I think, other skills in leadership in particular, um, which are to do with having authority and responsibility for others. So there are certain specific skills, gifts that are needed for the ministry, but there are also general skills uh, that are involved in exercising authority over others, organizing other people. Uh, and the Bible speaks about that as um, effectively the ability to manage. Language drawn from stewardship. Stewards in the Bible were people who managed property on behalf of others. So they perhaps looked after employees, they organized the work, they took care of the finances. In order to be a leader, you have to be an effective manager who is able to do that work. So um, when it comes to church leaders, again in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it speaks of how church leaders need to have been able to manage their families well. Now, in the ancient world, that doesn't just mean having obedient children. In the ancient world, the family was like a small business. The job of the father, that the household might have sources of income, it might own land, there might be slaves or servants, there might be an extended family to take care of. The elder of the church is meant to have been able to manage that wider family well, to provide for their needs, to organize them. It's going to involve time management, people management, managing resources, and those skills are going to be needed in leading the church. In my experience, many church leaders fail because they're good at preaching and teaching and they care for people, but they can't organize and manage. And the result is the church suffers. And for leadership, this ability to be able to manage and organize um, is inherent in virtually all leadership positions. And the greater the responsibility you have, the more people involved in the ministry, the higher the level of competence needs to be. So uh, the ability to be able to manage is crucial. Uh, alongside that, I think for Christian leaders, something that we again um, often neglect is Christian leaders of every kind require theological discernment. They require a level of theological discernment. Uh, clearly those who are church leaders require a very high level of theological discernment. But anybody involved in any kind of Christian leadership will require the ability to tell the difference between false teaching and true teaching between uh, the gospel and false gospels. Otherwise, the ministry will be compromised and the witness to the Lord Jesus will be undermined. Many Christian ministries have uh, ceased to be Christian because leaders weren't on guard theologically. So one of the tasks of Christian leaders is to exercise theological discernment. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Christian leaders need to know the things of first importance. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He rose again. He's going to come in glory to a judge. Uh, Christian leaders need to have confidence in the authority and the truth of God's word. If they don't fully understand it themselves, they need to have access to others who will be able to advise them. They need to know the difference between uh, the true gospel and false gospels. 
Paul says in Galatia, if, if it's not the true gospel, the gospel the apostles preached, then it's a false gospel. And those who preach a false gospel are to be accursed because they will destroy the church. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 4, 5 speaks of how we're ministering in the last days. That's the whole period from the ascension of Jesus till the return of Jesus. And during that period, uh, Paul says uh, it will be difficult. People will not love God. They will love money, pleasure, and themselves. And Christian leaders need to be on guard. And we need to listen to the scriptures, and we need to preach the word. Otherwise, people will be led astray by false teaching that looks persuasive, that sounds convincing, but uh, ultimately takes them away from Christ. So every Christian leader needs theological discernment for their leadership. And then lastly in this area, I think we need wisdom. Wisdom is an important and unappreciated skill. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell you in detail everything that you should do. You can't wake up in the morning and open to a verse of the Bible that will tell you how to deal with a difficult staff issue you've got. Or uh, exactly who you're to ask for money to help support the ministry. Uh, you may face challenges in the day and um, uh, the Bible doesn't give you a, a, a kind of a playbook, as it were, to tell you exactly what to do. Instead, you have to exercise wisdom. Wisdom is the skill, under God, of judging and discerning what is the best thing to do in the situation you face. And we need to cultivate wisdom. Uh, it's noticeable that King Solomon, in uh, 1 Kings, uh, when uh, God offered him anything he wanted, chose wisdom. Because he knew wisdom would be what would enable him to lead God's people well. James uh, urges us in his letter, if we lack wisdom, we should ask God for wisdom. I think many Christian leaders uh, fail to seek, develop, and ask God for wisdom to enable them to make the best decisions in the uh, situations that they face. So there are a variety of competences that Christian leaders need. They need the gifting for the role. They need the ability to be able to manage, theological discernment, uh, wisdom, um, and also, lastly, emotional intelligence. That simply means the ability to relate well to other people. It's secular language, but it simply describes the biblical skill of relating well to um, other people, understanding them, and how best to communicate with them, to uh, motivate them. Again, we uh, see this uh, being used and developed in the, uh, the New Testament. I think one of the um, absolute models of a lack of this emotional intelligence is Rehoboam in the Old Testament, who takes on from Solomon. You might remember the story, it's 1 Kings 12, not 2 Kings 12, as it is on the sheet. But you'll remember that um, uh, basically uh, he decides he's going to um, in, sort of increase the burden on the people and make them work harder. He won't listen to the older advisors who say, no, no, be more gentle. Instead, he listens to the young men who, says, uh, who say, no, no, be stricter and harsher. And the result is the people rebel against him. That's a classic example of a lack of emotional intelligence in the situation. Paul, in his letters, often demonstrates real skill in the way he speaks to people and engages with them. So in Galatians, uh, he knows that the uh, Galatians are in danger of turning from the gospel, so he's very firm with them. I can't believe you're deserting Jesus. And, and thinking about being circumcised. How could you be so stupid? When he writes to the Thessalonians, he's writing to encourage them when they're under pressure of persecution. So he's much more gentle, encouraging them, 
telling them um, uh, 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 sort of how he is encouraged with the report that's been received about how they're standing firm. Can you see he works differently? With the uh, Corinthians, he has a difficult relationship. And uh, they've obviously mis misunderstood some of his intentions. He hasn't come when they thought he should. He's written letters that have been, in their eyes, slightly harsh. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul is at pains to express his love to them, to win them over. Very often, leaders, we have to relate to people in the right way, to understand what is the best way of relating to them at a particular moment. And that's a skill that good leaders will have. They won't do everything the same way uh, in every situation. They'll carefully think, how are people feeling? How can I most help them? How can I um, uh, help them to come with me? How can I win them over? So those are a variety of skills for Christian leaders. So what will um, Christian leadership um, involve? What elements are uh, crucial then to um, being a leader? As we begin to put these different pieces together, what will uh, leadership uh, involve? Well, when we look at the example of leaders in the Bible, the key characteristic of leaders is leaders are people who want to take people somewhere. They have a clear idea of what needs to be done a clear sense of direction, and they take other people with them to fulfill that mission. So think, for example, of uh, Jesus. In uh, Mark chapter 1, Jesus is preaching the gospel. He's been preaching and healing in Capernaum. And he surprises his disciples by saying, I'm going to leave Capernaum, and we're going to go around all the other towns and villages. Why? because he says he wants to preach the gospel everywhere. So he knows what he's doing. He knows where he's going, and he takes his disciples with him. Similarly, uh, in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 16, Jesus uh, uh, sets out resolutely for Jerusalem. The moment has been reached in his ministry where he um, is going to go to Jerusalem, where he knows he'll be betrayed, he knows he'll go to the cross. And so he sets out, and again he takes his disciples with him, rebuking Peter when Peter tries to stop him heading to Jerusalem. Uh, think, for example, of uh, Paul. Paul, um, uh, through the book of Acts and the New Testament, he has a plan for taking the gospel to places where it hasn't been heard before. If we read in uh, Romans chapter 15, Paul speaks of how he wants to go to Spain, because that's the place where there is sort of the church hasn't yet sort of come, where the gospel hasn't been heard. And so he's writing to the church in Rome to get them to give him money, to support his mission plan, maybe to give him people. Paul has got a task that he wants to undertake, and he's going to lead um, others to join with him. Or 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, where Paul is planning a collection from the Gentile churches for the poor believers in Jerusalem, Judea. So he's writing to the churches to motivate them to give, so that a big gift will be able to be sent. All of those illustrate what leadership is about. So leadership will involve setting a vision. Under God, yes, but a vision of what we're trying to accomplish. Leadership will involve a, a strategic plan. How are we going to accomplish it? There are some leaders who have a massive vision, but they have no idea how to get there. Leadership involves both having a vision of what it is you're trying to accomplish for the Lord, but also knowing what the steps are that are needed to get there. Uh, leadership will involve organisation. It will involve bringing people together to accomplish that task so that they understand what it is you're doing and what they can contribute. 
Leadership will involve making sure that the right resources are available for the task to be undertaken. How many people will it need? How much money will it need? Leadership will involve motivating people to keep going, to um, uh, want to pursue that task. Uh, but especially when it gets hard, or there are challenges, to press on. It will involve managing people, making sure that the right people are doing the right jobs. It will involve sometimes significant change, and it can be hard to lead churches and organisations through periods of change, where perhaps things need to be done differently, or different people need to be given responsibilities. Those are the very things that Christians need to do in uh, leadership, but they need to do it in a Christ-like way, and they need to do it out of a desire to serve others and bring glory uh, to God. So um, if we're to be effective Christian leaders, we therefore need to grow in our leadership. Uh, everybody can become a better leader, no matter how good or inadequate a leader you feel today, you can become a better leader. We can all grow in our leadership skills. And I think that uh, if we want to be effective Christian leaders, we need to keep working on developing uh, our leadership. And there are a number of ways of doing that that I found helpful and that might be helpful for you. First and foremost, just belonging to a local church and serving in the life of a local church. The key way we learn to lead is in the life of the family of God. If you're not playing a part in the life of a local church, get involved and make church a priority. But we then benefit from being mentored by more experienced leaders. Try to find somebody who's a better leader than you are and ask them to teach you how to be a better leader. No matter what level you're at, there'll be people who are better leaders than you leaders you admire. Um, uh, see if you can find someone who you can learn from, who will share their experience with you. Um, there are lots of resources available. There are all sorts of books on leadership. There are blogs. Um, there are lectures, seminars online. We have more material available to us than any other generation. Actually, one of the challenges is not to look at too much of it and to instead carefully choose what's most helpful or what's a reasonable amount. I absolutely don't want you to go from this and suddenly spend the next month looking at nothing but leadership stuff. It's best to gradually grow in our leadership skills and select a small number of things that are really helpful. Um, uh, training. Uh, there may be training opportunities, conferences, programs that you can join. There are a number available through the European Leadership Forum that would uh, help you. Uh, maybe you might benefit from an internship. Perhaps um, uh, it might be a good thing if you're a Christian leader or a church leader for you to go and spend a little bit of time working with a different organization, seeing how they do things. We often recommend our pastors of sort of medium-sized churches, to go and spend some time alongside the leader of a larger church, just intern in a bigger church for a period of time. And that helps them just think about leadership differently. Or if you're leading a Christian organization, why not intern with a bigger organization? Or an organization that you think is doing well, ask if you can come and spend a couple of weeks just in the organization. And then, of course, you learn from your experience. Everything in life is an opportunity to learn. You learn from your successes and you learn from your failures. We need to spend time on self-evaluation. What did we do well? What should we have done differently? What can we learn from the particular experience of a task or a project that either went well or went badly? Do you take the time to reflect and learn from your own experience? So we can grow to become more effective Christian leaders. And so I want to urge each one of you, or all of us, to think about how can we develop as leaders and become better leaders. It won't just happen unless we take intentional steps. 
to think about our own uh, leadership development. And to do that, we need to be honest with ourselves. The problem with many leaders is they reach a point at which they're no longer honest with themselves, and they don't want anybody else to be honest with them, because they're slightly insecure. But good questions to ask yourself are, are these. Where am I weak in my leadership? Where am I conscious that I'm not as good as I should be? That then helps me to work on those areas. Where do I need to grow in character, in competence? How can I get help? If that's what I need, where can I go for help to be able to become more uh, effective? And the reason this is important is that God has given each of us gifts and opportunities for ministry. We are all servants, as it were. You remember the parable of the talents. We've all been entrusted with our master's property. And we have an obligation to be as effective as possible in his work. We're to be those who take ten talents and double it. Five talents and double it. We're not to be those who shove it in the ground and dig it up and just give back what we've received. We need to actively seek to develop our leadership so we can be as effective as possible. So that in the end, uh, we'll hear those glorious words, well done, good and faithful servant, from the Lord Jesus.